what is it? Oh, yeah, what is it? Oh, yeah. What is it? Oh, yeah. Just to say anything. What is this? Me? Is this she? Like, you get it. Okay, everybody. So my usual style is to interrupt the speaker. So Jeff is quite lucky today. Can you hear me clearly? Yes? Would you like to listen to the speaker being interviewed or would you like to chat more? Hey. Alright, so before we start, before we start, who in this room has bought the latest iPhone? Ah, uh, six. Nobody. Not yet. Who's not going to buy it? What are you going to buy instead? Tell me. No, I would go for iPhone six. Tell me. Okay. So before we start, I just want to let you know that this is the 88th Web Wednesday. So we've been doing this for 88 months in a row, which in this town is quite difficult. Um, we're going to start by having a few words from one of our partners. There's a great event that happens in Hong Kong called Social Media Matters. And if you're interested in social media and you want to meet the movers and groovers in that space, then uh, listen to Alexander who's going to say a few words. Hey everyone, thank you for having me here. Um, so we're, uh, I guess, sort of uh, supporting this event tonight. I wanted to chat with you guys about Social Matters, which is happening uh, the 14th to 15th of October in Hong Kong at the Grand Hyatt. What is, is it's an executive level uh, social media event. So what's great about it is you'll be hearing from a lot of great uh, speakers across the APAC region. Uh, one that you guys might be interested in is actually Gumi from Japan. They do mobile games. They're going to be at our event. As well, we've got great content creators such as Brian Buckner, who's a, a writer on the series of Friends, True Blood, some really uh, popular shows. And we've also got, um, if you're into any social media stars, we've got uh, Zach King from Vine. So he's got millions and millions and millions of followers. Three, three reasons why you should come to this event. The speakers, which is one. We have intimate kind of like interactive learning events. So for anyone that here, usually from games, startup companies, uh, you get to meet with these executives, maybe do some business deals, and also you know chat with um, and figure more about your industry from the other leading APAC people. Uh, we also have these content providers, people that can maybe do some branding or maybe do some kind of collaboration with you guys. It's a great event. Hell at the Grand Hyatt. It's not a stuffy kind of executive event at all. It's very fun. Have some drinks have some food, and then have a great time. So, um, we'll give this back to Polly, but we hope to see you all there. Uh, right now, tickets, you can find out more about this event at socialmediamatters.asia. I've left some booklets from the last year's events, you can kind of take a look at it. As well, we do group rates as well, so if you want to get together and do sort of like a Web Wednesdays kind of group, happy to give you, uh, depending on the size of the group, up to 20, 25% off, off of already a discount kind of 25% off for being part of Web Wednesdays. So, Thank you, and have a great event tonight. Thank you. So we, forgot, we forgot two things, mate. We forgot two things. Come back, come back. What was the discount code? And what's the website they have to go to? The discount code. I'm not really sure, but if you uh, chat with Napoleon, he'll have it. But uh, if you visit socialmatters.asia, you'll have all our events. I'm not, um, I think you should check out the speakers, see if it's something that it should be something that you guys are interested in, but uh, go t take a look at the event. If you can get a book, that those are free to keep, so just make sure you take one first. And, uh, yeah. So we have, if you keep nice and quiet tonight, and uh, we're gonna do a lucky draw at the end, and the winner will get uh, a free ticket to Social Media Matters, which is worth 350 US dollars. So it's worth keeping quiet. And putting lots of name cards in the glass outside, if you haven't already. So, thank you. Very good. All right, guys, so that, this is going to be a bit weird because we're going to be swapping the mic back and forth. Uh, but that's all right. I'm going to grab out of his hands when he gets boring. <laughs> so, I actually know this fellow because six years ago, I designed a game for California Fitness. Actually, I sold a game to California Fitness on Facebook. And I didn't know 
for my life how to design a game. So I went around Hong Kong and I found this young, tall, handsome game punk. And who happens to be the man next to me now. <laughs> he's still a punk, but he's a richer punk. So I want to know, the first question I have for you is, uh, when I first met you, you were very proud because you were like Hong Kong's top gamer. Right? Was that your title? What was your title? Uh, <laughs> I am a... Uh, I'm a Hawking Game developer. No, your title, my first name. <laughs> well, my, uh, when you first met me back then, uh, was it White Hand already? Or was well, that still before White Hand? So it's before White Hand, then I'll be a producer. Yeah. yeah. So, so he came to me and he said, I'm going to design a game for you. So I want to know, how does a, a game punk become listed on NASDAQ. <laughs> they all get I know you, it's not the website, it's the game, the company's not called gamepunk.com, but yep. I, I want to know, maybe briefly, you can tell us the journey of how uh, a game designer in Hong Kong is able, six years later, to take private jet planes around the States <laughs> trying, to persuade, trying to persuade Americans to invest in a Chinese game company. <laughs> well, you know, um, I started White Hand, that's when we worked together, and then after that, you know, um, I saw the, the opportunity of Icon. That was 2008. Um, actually, what happened was, after I met you, I started uh, at, when I was in White Hand, and then eventually I merged White Hand with an American company. What's White Hand? That's the, uh, White Hand Creation, that's the consultancy company where uh, I consulted Napoleon on making this uh, California. And, uh, you know, after that, you know, I met with a big client, uh, Interzone, and they're an American company. And uh, I sold my company to Interzone, and I become the VP of Interzone uh, Global uh, for the Asia business. Uh, but uh, what happened was in 2008, the Lehman Brothers crisis came in, and uh, the company was uh, gone, like, overnight. So, uh, but then in 2008, I also see a new opportunity with both my phone and, and all the smartphone things. So, I met up with some of my Chinese friends uh, uh, because I was in Guangzhou. I met up with some of my Chinese friends, and they're like, "Well, we, we also believe in smartphones." And I'm like, "Well, let's do something with smartphones." So we started Icon Sky in 2009. Uh, first started as an outsource developer, so we just worked for Huawei, Tencent on making this, like smartphone apps and app stores. And uh, by the end of 2011, uh, by the start of 2011, we start asking ourselves questions like, you know, is outsource what we want to do? And uh, we start thinking like, well, why don't we do something in games? Because both my partners are programmer, and I'm the only one in games. So like, I'm like, really? I'm like, I'm the only one that knows games. I'm like, you guys really want to make games? So why don't make apps? And they're like, nah, I don't want to make apps. We want to make something fun. So we're like, okay, let's do games. Um, we started being a developer, uh, which was unsuccessful, probably because my game design really sucks. Uh, but uh, eventually, what happened was, uh, even though our game is not that good. It got really distributed in China uh, because of my two other parts. What was the game? Uh, the game was called, and uh, you can still find it on. Uh, uh, you can still find it online. It's called iGame Dog. It's, uh, it's basically a game where uh, we try to aggregate other games that is not popular and sell it off at zero nine nine seven six. And but our game got distributed really well in China, and as we know. Whenever you talk about China, it's about messy, right? Um, back then in China, you know, and even till now, there's like over 300 app stores. There's like 20 different billing system. Uh, you need to navigate a, through a lot of the business ecosystem. You need to have a lot of relationship. And one of my friends that knows me from the West was like, hey Jeff, the game really sucks, but it seems like you guys are picking up a lot of traction in China. And I'm like, yeah, you know, like, how, how do you manage to get your game distributed in all these app stores? And I'm like, well, my partner knows how to know all these app stores and they're like, can I give you my game? And I'm like, sure. Can you put it on, on all these app stores? Yeah. So I put it on for them and then like two weeks later he came to me again and said, hey Jeff, I got another friend which have an app in which I made in the US and he wants it to be distributed in China. And since I have such good result, I introduce him to you and I'm like, okay. So I went back to my partner again and said, hey, can you distribute this app? And my partner's like, wait, 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 wait a second. Do you think this is a business? And I'm like, actually, that might be a business. So that's how we started Life with Sky uh, as a publisher. But that's not what you told the Americans, right? You said we had a plan, 
we're going to dominate the market in China. So this is really awful to interview like this. We're back and forth. But anyway, so you, you started distributing American games into China. I, I want to ask you about distribution in China because um, you say there's 300 different app stores, right? Uh, uh, anybody who develops games in Hong Kong is going, oh, you know, Apple, they're going Google, yeah. you know, or even Blackberry, we've had some yeah. Blackberry people, right? With, with the Windows Mobile. So out of those 300, are these owned by telcos or these entrepreneurial individuals? And I know all the big portals, right? Baidu will have theirs, NetEase will have them, etc. But do these 300 really survive, or is it like five at the top, and the rest are just like, it's a bit C? Or is it by province, or is it like, you know, cousins of Xi Jinping, or, or how does it work? Well, um, the 80-20 rule still apply. So the top 20% of the distribution channel have 80% of the traffic. Um, so we're talking about mainly like carriers, app store, um, major OEF like Xiaomi, Lenovo, Huawei, and of course the internet giant like Baidu, 360, Tencent. Um, roughly, you're looking at like you need to work at least with the top 30 app stores in China to get your app redistributed. Um, but it's more. Uh, but if you care about the brand and if you care about privacy, then working with all 300 channels become very important. Because if you don't work with a channel, then they part the game. So that's why I just got with all 300 channels just to make sure that our game is not pirated. How easy is it to pirate a game? If, if I spoke to, when I spoke to you when you were a young punk, you're like, nobody else can do what I can do. <laughs> right? Yeah. So how easy, I mean, I know in China you can make things overnight, but how easy is it? I mean, you're saying, give us an example. I mean, the games you distribute, Temple Run, yep. these things, I mean, are they pirated as soon as they come out with version two, version three? Well, uh, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's two things, right? One is being cloned and one's being pirated. Pirated is just like bootleg, right? Um, so in China, to put like an app that is out, it's going to take like five seconds. The minute you put it out on Google's Play, the minute you put it on Apple, uh, Apple App Store, it's going to be pirated right away. Um, to clone the game, however, is much harder. So uh, to clone a game, um, typically in China, it will take anywhere from seeing the first clone in around the third month or the fifth month. Um, but it also depends on the quality of the clone. clone. Um, that's why I just got really pride on publishing some of the best games in the world, which is much harder to home. So, so tell us, so you started distributing these games and your friends start saying, hey, help me distribute this. At what point does that become a business? And you go, okay, we can make some money out of this. First, the first question I have is, you know, how do you charge? But at what point do you say, right, you know, this, this is a serious business. So, you know, after the first two apps, um, I got more friends came in, and then it, um, I think it was back in mid of 2011, um, we started saying like, well, you know, guys, if you want me to distribute your games, act as a massive distributor for games in China, uh, we will charge any, uh, we will charge 20% of the, uh, of the service fee. Whatever we get, uh, after the billing, after the distribution fee, we want to charge 20%. And the developer keeps the remaining eighty percent. So, who pays for the marketing? You do, or, or the developer pays for the marketing? So, so back then we were, we were purely distributor. So it's just like you know, give me your app and I put it on the store. Uh, of course, eventually people start seeing that what I'm doing, and say like, well, you know, I can do that too. So um, we changed our model from a distributor to a publisher, which is like, well, you know, I'll publish your game. And I want to pay for top, but I want to pay for the marketing. Uh, but yeah. uh, I'm stupid. What is the difference between a distributor and a publisher? One sounds much posher than the other, but what does it actually mean? In, you're doing the same thing, right? You're publishing games. You're pushing them through channels. Well, as a distributor, all I do is whatever you have. If it's A, I get I, I put it on the store as A. As a publisher, then I'll start telling you, it's like, well, your game is not really right. You need to do this. You need to change that. Um, I start paying money for marketing. I start helping you to get uh, promotions. I try to talk to uh, distribute, uh, app stores and say like, hey, can I, can I have the what's hot banner? Can I have this, can I have that? So I'm adding more value uh, to a developer. So, so you start doing that, and is it mostly American games? Or you, do you, you then go to the Koreans and the, because I know in, in the, you know, in the, in the Wang Ba era, it was all Korean games, right? It was, uh, in your World of Warcraft or whatever, but 
So at what stage do you, you know, does that migrate? Because China's always had, well, five years ago, ten years ago, was what, far, right? The internet. When did it start all migrating to mobile? And was it all American games? Or did you start working with the Koreans and the Japanese as well? Well, you know, um, if we look even at the PC MMO era, which is what, my era, China really started with American games. Because whenever you have a new ecosystem, like a smartphone, American will be the first one that can produce the highest quality game. And then eventually what happens is, even though American can pro produce high quality games, Korean and Jap Japanese can produce the same quality, but it's more cultural, it's more right for Asian. So what I, I foresee already back in 2011 is like, in 11 and 12, it's probably maybe going to American games. But in 2013, I start focusing a lot on my resource into Jap uh, getting Japanese game and Korean game. And this is what, it shows as the history goes is it was right where you know in, in, in today's market in, if you look at China a lot of the games now are more Korean and Japanese and also Chinese. What I foresee around 12 to 4, 24 months after this will be all Chinese games in China. Like even Korean and Japanese games can penetrate the market. That's interesting because uh, when you did your IPO list here, I looked at some of the numbers, they said 80% of your revenue came from American games. Yeah. Right? So how are you going to migrate away from the was it Silver Surfer or somewhere? How are you going to Subway Surfer? Yeah. How are you going to migrate away from the these into Chinese games? Are you starting to produce your own games? Well, you know, first thing is when I say you cannot penetrate anymore, means you can have a new game that is going to be as popular as it is. But if you have a game that is made in the West and you have penetrated the market before already, you're going to stick, just like Mario, you know. Um, and of course, we're migrating, we're, we're diversifying the, the, the our content acquisition uh, pool. So you know, since 2000, uh, or late 2012, I've been acquiring games from Korea and Japan, and they are already uh, promising uh, games that is get uh, ranked in the chart. And of course, we're also talking to a lot of Chinese developer that uh, need a publisher in China because, as we know, you know, now the app store is so populated, it's so crowded. Uh, of course, the developer can get to a user quite easier than it, it was, um, but they still need publisher which have knowledge on how to um, design and monetization, how to position themselves in the market, uh, have the marketing budget to actually market, uh, use acquisition costs on mobile is like going like crazy, um, and as a publisher, that's what we, what, what we can help. So you're from Hong Kong, and uh, in this room there's a couple of you know, Hong Kong game developers, or related. You know, Hong Kong has, as you know from your old days, quite a history of making games. You know, we've got we've got in Singapore, Yatsu's outfit, Danny Mocha, is doing pretty well. Uh, we've got a couple of guys here, was it eight elements who are just distributing games. Do you see a role for Hong Kong in terms of creating? Or what's the role of Hong Kong in, in the whole kind of infrastructure of games? Is it, is it purely a marketing thing. I mean, there's a lot of people here creating games. My experience is most people creating games in Hong Kong are terrible at selling them, right? Because they haven't got the cash flow or the, the knowledge. Right? So, what do you see as the role of you know? You're a Hong Kong guy, listed a company from Shenzhen in Nasdaq. There must be something in there, a role model. So, tell us what, how do you see Hong Kong fitting into this? Well, actually, a lot of my fellow Hong Kong guys. Um, that worked with me back in the old days, and now you know Tencent or Chinese company. Now, first, from a person, from a professional point of view, uh, a common profession in gaming, um, what we have is our dual legal capability, or even trilingual capability. Since now most common people will speak Mandarin, Cantonese, and English. Um, in China, this is actually a very, very rare thing. Um, a game guy that speaks English and can speak Chinese. Um, that's why I was valuable to my company back then. Now, as a company goes, um, I think you know if you're in development, the the, the 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 value that you can bring into the value chain is um, because Hong Kong people grow up with Western, Japanese, and Chinese influence. So actually, I I've, I've always been telling by my, my fellow Hong Kong developers like you know what we can do is something more innovative, but we can make something that is right for Chinese too. We should be able to make a game better for China than a game than, than the developer in Japan, in Japan or Korea. So, uh, are there any good examples of games from Hong Kong that do exactly what you just said? I'm not a gamer, so I can't. Tell me a good Hong Kong game. 
frankly, they, uh, well, there's actually one. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's made by a company called Seesaw. Um, they took a Chinese IP, uh, which is a robot IP, made it in Hong Kong, um, and it's published by this guy. Right now, it's roughly doing around 10 million, uh, 10 million from a month. That's cool. Uh, it's, uh, I don't even know the English name. It's, the Chinese name called uh, Guo Bo Sang Gong. It's a, it's a, Anybody it's here a, it's a like robot, it? robot game. Does anybody play Guo Bo Sang Gong? No? Not yet. Not yet. He's in the middle of it. He's down on it now. There you go. Ten million and one. So that's good. Yeah, so I think as a developer, you know, I think Hong Kong developer can really leverage the knowledge that they have with Chinese and innovate more than uh, a million Chinese company. But I've, I've had events here where I've had uh, Battle of the Apps where app developers, game developers pitch their idea. And a lot of them are trying to get their idea and not sell it to China, but sell it you know, into the US or into Europe. Do you think this is the wrong direction to go? I mean, now that the big international, the big Chinese portals, you know, WeChat is going international and they've got games. Do you think it's a healthy direction to go if you're a Hong Kong game developer to look outwards rather than up north? Well, I think as any developer is today, um, we're not bound by any geographic uh, situation, you know, because internet is there's no geography of internet. You can go north, you can go US. I think it really comes down to is what do you feel? Uh, what do you feel more comfortable in? Um, China would make a, to me would make a little bit more sense because it's closer to us. Uh, we, we can understand the culture better, but of course, if you're ABC in Hong Kong, it makes more sense for you to make a game for for, for America. Or if you study in Britain, it makes more sense for you to make a game for for for, for the UK. But if you really go up from Hong Kong, you know, I think China might make more sense for you because you have more understanding of Chinese user behavior. Yeah, but say I'm a game developer. I, I go to sell it to, on iTunes. I have one place to collect my money. I go to China, I have 300 places to collect my money. From my experience of 20 years doing business in China, having 300 places to collect money is a fucking nightmare. So, is that the right advice to say go and sell it to China? That's why there's a good guy. You just collect money from me. <laughs> if you're a game developer and you're a game developer like me, you just collect money from me. No, but I think also it's like if you're a game developer in Hong Kong, you know, I'm not saying that you need to work all the minutes right away. If you really want to do it yourself, maybe work with Tencent, work with Xiaomi. I actually know a lot of Korea that just work with Xiaomi because they don't want that all the hassle and then test their, their app, test the game in Xiaomi. If it works, then they scale up their company to work with all the minutes in So how do you, you know, a company from Shenzhen, I know you've got a lot of guts and a lot of hooks, but I said the same for your but how do you compete with China Mobile Entertainment Group and Chanda and you know your little brats compared to these guys, right? So how do you compete with them? Well, CMG we're not a little brat compared to them. Um, actually, our market cap is bigger than them. <laughs> um, but uh, we're like Tencent, and Tencent is our investor, so we don't really fight with Tencent. Um, and since Tencent is our, big, uh, is our biggest shareholder, we are really blasted and, and protected. Uh, by the internet trend. But you know, what, what I think that what we're very special of is, you know, we, we, when we started the business, and that's actually my partner's idea is, you know, we corner ourselves. We like, you know, what we need to do is we just do mobile. We only do mobile. And in mobile, we actually have a big business for mobile. We're actually the largest independent publisher in China now. With the largest user base. We have over 450 million user bases in China. So 450 million means people who've downloaded your games? So how many of those are active on, on, a, on a monthly basis? I saw the media, it was 98 million, but that's the media. We're not talking the media there. So at our 480 million, how many are actually spending money? Well, spending money right now, uh, we are controlling the, the, the spending at around 7 to 8% uh, of, of the 480. Of the of a monthly active, of a monthly active user, which is probably around 100 million. That's a big number. Yes. So to finish the story, your, how did you end up doing IPO in America? Why are you doing an IPO in Hong Kong? What's wrong with Hong Kong? <laughs> Ooh. I know Jack Ma didn't want to do it here because he has all kinds of dodgy shareholders. <laughs> do you have dodgy shareholders in your Ab company? Absolutely. Well, if you consider Tencent as dodgy shareholders, <laughs> no, no, all, 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 
Yeah. Well, no. Actually, what 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 uh, why we we did Nasdaq instead of Taobao was uh, there was a couple reasons for it. Um, actually, I was uh, I was telling my partner I want to do Hong Kong. I want to do Hong Kong. Makes me feel more proud. Um, but when we look at both market, the first problem that we see in Hong Kong is Hong Kong stock market don't really uh, ban this game company. Um, well, Hong Kong's ten cents of it. Oh, excuse me. Well, ten cents is not a game. Tencent is a platform, it's a gigantic platform company. Yeah, but they make all the money from the Yes, but what we find with Tencent, the thing we talk about Tencent, Tencent is like, well, if you're an IT company in the Hong Kong stock machine, until you really prove yourself as a gigantic platform, the, the Hong Kong stock, uh, the, 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 the people in Hong Kong don't really understand you. So until you become a gigantic company, your transaction volume will be very low. Now that's, that's the first problem is, you know, when, I, when we think about ourselves, it's like, well, we need at least five years, or even 10 years, or maybe never to get to where Tencent is. So, you know, we need, we need high transaction volume. The second thing is, you know, as iPhone Sky goes, um, me and my partner look at Chinese companies. And what we realize is, if we, if we look at companies back uh, before 2011, what they have as an opportunity is information is off-sync. So they can close. They can copy business model. We look at Tencent, QQ. We look at Sina, uh, Yahoo. We look at Baidu, Google. We look at 360, North American Virus. Because information is so off-sync, Chinese company can go look at US and say, oh, this, this model work, this product work, let me bring it to China. But if we look at today's market, that's not anymore the case. First of all, is information is pretty much transparent to China. Second is there's internet giant that can do even faster than you. So what Chinese company has an opportunity for is to be global. Because every company that wants to go through a globalization needs to figure out Chinese market. If you haven't cracked China, you haven't cracked the, cracked, cracked the world. And for us, iDream Sky, what we believe is we want to not just become a Chinese publisher, but also become a global publisher. And listing on Nasdaq makes more sense because that's a, it's a true international stock exchange uh, market. So, what, what were the difficult, what were the kind of questions that you got asked when you were going around America? They're like, yeah, you know, was it? Well, did they know where you were from? Did they know where Shenzhen is? They don't know where London is, so I'm sure they don't know where Shenzhen is. They know where Scotland is now. So, to, I mean, I'm curious when you're when you're flying around in this private jet. And you meet, you know, a fund manager. What, do they ask you difficult questions? Because I've just been raising funds all this stuff. Not the same with them. In London, they ask bloody difficult questions. What kind of questions do they ask you? Well, there, there's this one specific uh, uh, investor. You know, when I went into the room, he was a Korean. He sat down, and his first question was like, Jeff, I've invested in Shenda. I was one of the first investors in the Oh shit. I've, I've invested in game industry in China 10 years ago. I, I've seen every single Chinese company that went IPO in the US, and you guys are all shit. You guys are all one hit one. You guys, all you guys do is, you know, come to US, take our money, and then like this, and then eventually you guys tell me, <laughs> tell me your explanation. And he, that was very, very aggressive. And, Every sentence I give him, like within like 30 seconds, he will start far far on another question. Well, then you're just doing that. Then you're just doing this. You know, uh, what if you have no game to publish? Uh, uh, what if, what if, what, what, what if like smartphone tank in China? What if the government like decide to uh, 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 ban ban uh, smartphone and uh, ban game? What do you do? <laughs> Uh, so, you know, especially I think uh, uh, this IPO tour, you know, and this is an extreme investor, but I think in, in, in general, the investors are concerned about a couple of things. Uh, one is the smartphone growth in China. Uh, and in China right now, we have around uh, uh, 1.2 billion. Yeah, 1.2 billion. But 1.2 billion mobile subscriber. Um, in smartphone right now, we are around at a fringe of around 600 million. And mobile game user is doing really around 500 million. So there's still a lot of phones. You're saying out of 600 million people have phones. 600 million that have smartphones. 500 million play games on their smartphones. Jesus. That's quite high. How does that compare to other countries? I mean, I'm sure if you go to Germany, you know, one in 30. <laughs> what you're saying is like, like my math is not good. 87%. Oh, 
Like you're saying quite a large amount of people oh, on the phone. Sorry. And I understand that.